Hey everyone, welcome to Unconventional Marketers, how top entrepreneurs start small and profit big without conventional marketing. I'm Michelle Lopez Boggs, and today I'm here with Frank Kane. And Frank spent nine years at Amazon and IMDB developing and managing the technology that automatically delivers product and movie recommendations to hundreds of millions of customers all the time. Frank holds 17 issued patents in the fields of distributed computing, data mining, and machine learning. In 2012, Frank left to start his own successful company, Sundog Software, which focuses on virtual reality environment technology and teaching others about big data analysis. Today, Frank has taught over 600,000 people around the world about big data, machine learning, and system design through on-demand online courses. So welcome, Frank. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, your background is amazing. Um, so really quickly, like tell people um, how you were working with Amazon and then how you got into starting your own business, basically creating these courses. Yeah, it's one of those stories of kind of like the chance encounters you have steering your life in a whole different direction, right? So um, gather around the campfire and old man Frank will tell you a story about it. Uh, so I was working as a senior manager at Amazon back in 2012, I guess it was. And uh, after being there nine years, the weather was kind of getting to me and my family in Seattle. So we decided it was time for a change. Uh, and we picked Florida as a place to go to. Now, unfortunately, back then, you couldn't just transfer from state to state in Amazon because of tax nexus issues. So that meant I had to leave Amazon. Uh, so I figured, well, before I get a real job again, why don't I try uh, self-employment? So I started doing some freelance work for a while after we moved here and quickly discovered that freelance work is really just trading one set of bosses for another set of bosses. You know, you're still trading your time for money. So it wasn't that fun. Uh, but one of those gigs was actually doing curriculum development for a online school in New York City. Um, and what happened is someone at Udemy, which is a big online course marketplace, uh, saw that work and reached out to me and said, hey, Frank, uh, we need some courses on Udemy about big data stuff and data processing. Uh, do you want to give it a try? And at the time I thought, well, why not? You know, what do I have to lose? It's just, uh, just some time. How hard can it be? And well, it turns out it's actually pretty hard, but uh, it, it worked out, right? So like I launched my first course on Udemy back in 2015, I think it was. And it was kind of a flop, honestly. It made like a couple hundred bucks. Um, but instead of giving up, I doubled down on it. And I used those first students that I had in the first course to market my second course to. And that second course was much more successful because it was much more comprehensive. And I just kept kind of building on that audience over time to the point where I'm at today with, you know, hundreds of thousands of students around the world and millions of dollars in revenue from it. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, so I wanted everybody to hear that he started with the first course and it was a flop and now you you kept going, right? So obviously you didn't quit. Um, what, and this is not on the list of questions I sent you, but what was it that made you not quit? Well, I didn't want that work to be a waste of time primarily. So, you know, I spent a, a couple of months making that course. I'm like, gosh, I don't want that to be for nothing. Uh, what if, you know, if I just went a little bit further and push it a little bit harder, maybe, maybe that's all it takes, right? So, you know, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But uh, I figured it was worth one more try. <laughs> awesome. uh, I'm glad it did. And, you know, part of that was just you to me kind of working with me as well. So, you know, I kind of reached out back to them and said, hey, you know, you said you needed this topic. It didn't do that well. And uh, they actually came back and offered some guidance on choosing the right topic and making the right kind of course that would resonate with their students. And uh, that advice they offered turned out to be really valuable as well. Yeah. And so who are these students who are buying this? Because this is a very, these are very technical topics that you're teaching about, which are way above my head. You basically summarized it for me as gleaning insights from mass, massive amounts of data. So who are these students that want to learn these courses? Who would you say is your ideal customer? Well, there's the customers and then there's, there's the ideal customer. Those are two different sets of people. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's kind of two different kinds of customers that I have. One is people that are trying to upgrade their career. They're trying to learn new skills to get a better paying job and, you know, have a better life as a result. And I'd say that's the vast majority of the students in my courses. Um, they're offered at very accessible prices. You know, in India, for example, it's the equivalent of like $5 in the U.S. So anyone can learn this stuff. You know, they just have to have the... Um, the motivation to do so, right? And if it, it's on them to turn that into a career, but you know, it's the first step for a lot of people. Um, the other one is just established people who already have a, a job in this field and want to learn some new skills and keep their skills current. So the other thing that we see are people who already have a job doing 
uh, these technical things and they have some new problem they're faced with, they have to learn quickly how to solve it. I might have a lecture on how to do that. So they go out and seek that out. Um, the ideal student, however, is one that's actually qualified to learn this stuff. So, you know, unfortunately we do get a lot of people who have no background in technology at all and they say, I'm going to learn machine learning and get rich. And they jump right into one of these courses and they have no idea what I'm talking about and they get angry and frustrated. So, uh, you know, those are, those are the sorts of customers that I try to avoid. <laughs> so they don't have the right motivation. They're just in it for the money. Um, what, what do you think is the right motivation? Like who can really do benefit with this kind of learning? I mean, obviously you have to have a passion for technology and, uh, you know, algorithms and kind of teasing information out of data sets. So there's a certain reward and a certain mentality that comes with that. You know, if you're, uh, not coming at it with a genuine interest in what this stuff is, and you're just doing it for the money, you're probably not going to be successful. You're going to give up early on. Right. And you got to have the background too. Like you got to have some basic math, some basic, you know, programming background. Um, you can't just jump into this stuff. Yeah. So an English major like me would not do well with this. Probably I could learn like the high level stuff, but yeah, I'm not going to do the technical stuff. Um, so I noticed that you have on your website, a membership model. So you're selling like a subscription to all your courses. And then you have a bunch of courses on Udemy. So like out of that 600,000 or so people that have bought your courses, like what percentage would you say is which, and, uh, which is Udemy, which is your, your site? Oh yeah, it's really hard to compete with Udemy. So Udemy and you know a few other uh, large platforms like Udemy are the vast, vast, vast majority of my students. Um, the membership that I offer on my site is really kind of a failed experiment. Um, I, I put it out there and I started like trying to funnel people into it. Uh, and a few people did. You know, I think a lot of them were just kind of like fans from Udemy who wanted to support me a little bit more. Maybe some of them didn't know about Udemy and you know, subscribed to my site instead. Uh, but I actually stopped promoting it and. The reason is kind of weird. I just kind of felt bad about it. You know, I saw a lot of people signing up and they wouldn't engage with the content. They just basically forgot they had this subscription and they kept paying me 30 bucks a month forever. I'm like, I don't feel good about that. You know, like you should be getting something out of this deal, guys. So um, I, I just stopped doing it because it wasn't really a significant source of revenue to begin with. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, okay, so like you you mentioned to me that you you do have a funnel, but like you said, your your content could be better. I haven't actually looked at your content, but um, so as far as like, is there overlap between the Udemy students and then your students? Like if they sign up to your, your site, are they, is there going to be like duplicates or they've already seen on Udemy, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's the same content, um, across both platforms. So, you know, what a lot of people do when they're trying to like launch their own site outside of Udemy is they'll have some higher ticket item that they offer. And usually that involves, um, you know, more one-on-one -on -one interaction with the instructor, you know, consulting or, you know, office hours, things like that. Um, I just don't have time for that, right? So like my time is best spent creating more courses on Udemy because that's what works for me. So um, in my case, I'm just trying to like compete with myself on Udemy and, you know, ultimately that's not a good plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's that's really cool actually. Um, so Udemy, um, how, how is it that these courses that you've created gain so much traction? Like, did Udemy promote them? Or like, did you do anything to promote them? Like, what would you say was your overall marketing strategy to build that? How did that happen? It's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, the, the whole value proposition of a marketplace like Udemy is that they do a lot of the marketing for you, right? So they're the ones that are out there making sure everything's SEO optimized for Google and doing some online advertising on your behalf. Uh, but a lot of the onus is on the instructor still. So the most important thing is to choose your topic wisely. So if you choose to teach a topic that already has a thousand other courses in that topic that are way ahead of you in terms of the number of reviews, you're not going to have a chance, right? So I see that's like the number one mistake that I see new, new instructors making. And then they wonder why their course isn't selling. So you got to find a talk, a topic that's filling some unfilled need, number one. Number two, you do need to do some marketing of your own. You know, I mean, if you have an established base of students on Udemy or whatever platform you're on, you want to promote that new course to the people who already know you, right? Those are your existing fans. So blasting out an announcement saying, hey, I got a new course, check it out. That's probably the most simple and effective thing you can do. And furthermore, you want to make sure that your own landing page on the platform is optimized. You know, you want to make sure that if people do find your course, A, that you have the right keywords, so you do show up in search to begin with. And once they get there, that what they see is compelling and that page converts well. And a lot of that is also in the uh, control of the instructor. That's very cool. So I love what you said about the, these courses are really here to fill an unfulfilled need in the marketplace. And how do you know what that is? Do you survey people? Do you like just listen to the comments or how do you figure that out? 
yeah, I mean, you kind of got to be scrappy and figure it out however you can. Um, Udemy uh, has a really handy tool called Marketplace Insights, where you can actually research the search traffic on any topic and also research the existing courses in that topic. And you can use that data to really make a firm decision as to how much interest there is in this topic and are you one of the first movers in it or not. Um, those topics are hard to find where you have that combination, but they're still out there, especially in the world of technology where things are changing all the time. So that's kind of the number one tool. There's also things like Google Trends and just keeping on top of um, you know, what's going on in the industry in general, right? So uh, you just kind of got, got to keep your ears open and do your research. Yeah. Okay. So you said the word data. So I'm going to switch gears a minute and talk about um, something that my I know my listeners, a lot of my listeners are very interested in, which is human design and astrology. And before this interview, I asked you if you believe in that, if, if um, you know what your human design type, and you said you're a, a manifesting generator. And um, so anybody out there that knows what that means, they'll, they'll kind of have, that, that basically means that you're like a superhero and you can do anything and pull it off successfully as far as like, <laughs> yeah, so congratulations. That's good to hear. Um, there's other types that have a very difficult time with figuring out how to um, make their their path successful. So, um, yeah, what is your perspective on like astrology and and that kind of stuff where it's like the stars and the planets are influencing your life or who you are? Because I know you have a, a very um, you had a very succinct answer to that. So could you share that? Well, my, my hobby is actually astronomy. So actually, you know, studying the stars and planets and galaxies and nebulas and stuff like that. I actually have an observatory in my backyard. So that's a real passion of mine. Uh, so I tend to approach, you know, the planets and celestial bodies from a more scientific standpoint, you know, studying what they're made of, what they look like, what they're doing, right? So um, to me, astrology is kind of the, uh, the antithesis of that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I definitely, you know, some of what you said, though, does resonate, you know, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, like uh, the perseverance that I have is kind of like what has led to a lot of my success. And I think a lot of that is innate in people like you're kind of born with that, you know, like there's a certain personality type that, you know, gives you that trait, um, where that comes from, mostly genetics, probably, but you know, does something else drive that? Is it more about uh, environment? And does the time at which you're born influence that? Maybe I have an open mind. Yeah. And I think you said in the email um, that you, you believe that we really create our own success and it's kind of up to our actions and what we do with our life. It's, you know, it's not just going to be handed to us and that sort of thing, which I a hundred percent agree with. And um, yeah, so that, that's very interesting. And as far as like the data, so you're looking at data and human design looks at like intuition. So I'm actually curious, and this was not on the list of questions, but do you like tap into your intuition? How do you see that? Is that even a concept in your world? And like, how do, yeah, how do you navigate that? That's a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. So you might be surprised to hear that even though I teach data science, I don't actually rely on data all that much because I know how much data can lie to you. You know, it's very, very easy to misinterpret data and draw the wrong conclusions from it, even for an expert. So a lot of it really does come down to what you've learned over the years and your intuition. And, um, you know, you're not just like making stuff up. Intuition is like that your brain finding patterns out of its own experience over your life. It's, it's real stuff. You know, it's very similar to how artificial intelligence works or machine learning. So, you know, people kind of like glorify machine learning and AI, but you know, your brain's doing the same thing. So if your brain's telling you something, you might want to listen to it. Yeah. Your brain, or what about like your heart? Do you listen to your heart? <laughs> That's like the intuition, like, or your, even your body, like if you get a gut feeling or, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of want that in as the same thing, you know, like uh, if there's something subconscious that's, you know, uh, promoting, provoking a emotional reaction to an idea, then it's probably, you know, your head trying to tell you something there, you know, your, your past experiences are saying, Hey, something's wrong with this idea. It doesn't sit right. And uh, that's probably worth exploring for sure. Yeah. And that actually reminds me of something that I was reading about you. Um, I think this was mentioned on one of your videos. You said that you previously did some kind of work for the military and they were using something that you created like um, for basically to kill people. So can you like summarize that? And, and yeah, because I'm curious. Yeah, that was a long time ago, man. Um, I used to work in uh, training systems for the military. So before I did all this stuff, I was actually a video game developer. If you remember Sierra online, I worked there and, you know, King's quest and all that stuff. Um, but I ended up like writing flight simulators and graphics, uh, systems for flight training or, you know, uh, maritime training, things like that. You know, where we're just trying to train war fighters to, you know, not get killed. And that seemed like, you know, a pretty good thing to be doing, you know, preventing people from getting killed. That's, that's a good thing. 
Um, but they ended up actually taking that technology and using it for actual command and control systems. So, you know, my software that I thought was just being used for training was actually being used for really doing bad things. <laughs> and I wasn't cool with that. Uh, so that's actually when I like picked up and moved to Amazon in Seattle. Uh, I just, you know, wanted to do something that was a little bit less evil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you allowed to talk about Amazon? Like just big, big picture principles of what you learned working there. Like, I know like everyone's like, oh, Amazon is like this um, brilliant company. They figured out everything like one click this and they patented the one click and that kind of thing. Like what's like um, a few big picture things that you, you just got from working with them? Oh, it was a huge learning experience. Um, you know, it was um, kind of the biggest thing I, that struck me from it was just being surrounded by incredibly smart people all the time. Like there was so much to learn from there, you know, including Jeff Bezos. Like he is a truly, whatever you think of the man, he is brilliant. You know, like you can learn a lot from that guy. Uh, so just having the opportunity to be at Amazon in its early years and, uh, you know, being surrounded by these innovators in the field was, was really something. And um, yeah, I got nothing bad to say about them really. That's awesome. And so like, is there any kind of like pressure being around so many smart people or just, is it a good pressure? It like causes you to rise up and be your better self and like, yeah, figure, figure stuff out better. Absolutely. You know, like uh, I mean, at first it's horrifying, right? You know, like you have like massive imposter syndrome coming into a place like that. And uh, when you start to realize that you can actually hold your own with these people, then that's great. you know, it does force you to up your game and always be learning and uh, you know, becoming a better engineer, manager, whatever it is that you're doing there. Yeah, that's really cool. So switching gears again, um, what kind of marketing do you personally love just as a consumer that you've seen from other companies and then you ended up buying their product and loved it? And which kind of marketing do you hate? You just can't stand it. <laughs> yeah, I love the marketing that uh, targets me really well, right? So like the hardest part of marketing is finding the people whose solution resonates with them, who have a problem that you're trying to solve, right? Um, in my case, I'm a nerd, you know, so things that are targeted at my nerdy interests are, are, are solving a, a problem that I didn't even know I had, you know, like I need a t-shirt that's about, you know, Star Trek or whatever, <laughs> like show me that I'll buy it. Right. So if I see something that really resonates with my passions, then that's, that's good advertising. So well-targeted advertising, I would say is, is the good stuff. Uh, the bad stuff is just the snake oil stuff that's out there. You know, there's so many people out there that are like, get rich quick, uh, you know, follow my 10 step plan. And uh, you'll make jillions of dollars, uh, you know, that's, that gets old real fast. So I, I have a, not a whole lot of patience for that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you don't mind being targeted. You actually like that when they target you well, you don't feel like they're spying on you or anything weird like that. It's just like, oh, here's a problem. This is a solution. This is exactly what I need. You don't actually, um, you're not against like the targeting aspect of it. I mean, there's a point where it gets creepy, right? You know, like I, I disable all the uh, tracking on my phone that keeps track of where I am, for example, because that's too far, I think. Uh, but if I see an ad on Facebook that is actually interesting to me, uh, that's a good thing. I feel good about that. If I see a poorly targeted ad, I might get angry about that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, targeting when done right, I think is a beneficial thing for everybody involved. Okay. And the snake oil people that you were talking about. So um, uh so that's like, they're, they're trying to sell you a get rich quick. Do you think there is such a thing as get rich quick? Is it a long steady uh, trek upwards and takes a long time? Or like, have you seen people get rich quick? And like, what, what's behind that? Like, I, I mean, kind of think that's like nature, like a tree growing. It's not going to yeah. happen quick, right? I mean, in my case, it took what, uh, seven years to get where I'm at right now through online courses, right? So that's definitely a, a long game. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who get lucky and invest in the right thing, right? But um, it's luck, right? So there's there's no quick uh, quick path. I think it just takes perseverance and um, you know, really giving things your your best effort and trying to grow on what you've done in the past. And uh, people offering you otherwise should be viewed with skepticism, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what what has been the most effective, aka profitable, form of marketing in your opinion? And what's been the most ineffective, like the biggest waste of time and money? Mm. Well, the effective stuff, you know, again, it gets back to uh, matching up what solution you have with the people who have the problem you're trying to solve, right? So um, for me, that's mostly within the Udemy platform. So if we define marketing as sort of raising awareness of what you are offering people uh, to the right people who actually need what you offer, um, simple things like SEO optimization on your your course landing page can be the most effective thing you can do. 
you know, probably the biggest bang for my buck that I ever got was just going back to my promotional videos for my courses and producing them more professionally, right? That had a, a very measurable and immediate impact on sales. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the stuff that works the best. And also just sending out promotional uh, announcements to my existing students. So, you know, if you have people who have bought your stuff in the past and liked it, uh, if you have a new thing to offer them, then just sending them a, a notification saying, hey, here's this new thing you can learn, go check it out. That's probably more effective than absolutely anything. Um, with Udemy, for example, they let you send two promotional announcements per month to your existing student base. And for five minutes of work, I get a couple of thousand bucks. Like what's wrong with that? So that's, that's what works. Yeah, that's really cool. And what's been the most challenging thing in marketing your courses? Most challenging thing has been marketing off the platform. So um, the thing that I've never been able to crack and most other instructors can't crack either is how do I run paid advertising um, on social media that actually breaks even? The problem is that the price points of these courses is so low that the cost of the ads exceeds what you actually get back, even if you look over the long haul. So uh, that's, that's difficult because, you know, some people attribute a value to likes or, you know, raising awareness and things like that, but you can't measure the value of that really. Right. So, um, it's, it's tough to really justify that kind of ad spend on the, these low ticket items. So when you say social media advertising, um, you mean actual like Facebook ads or like, um, are you on Instagram? Uh, yeah, I haven't tried advertising on Instagram yet, but okay. account, there's, yeah. there's also like promoted posts where you can boost mm -hmm. a post. Some people believe that's a scam and some people have actually made money from it. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's kind of a crapshoot. You just have to try it and see what works. And if you, if it works, stick with it. But um, what's, what's been your experience with like running paid ads and, and do you think they work? What makes it work if they do work? And yeah, share that. Yeah, it depends on what you're offering, its price point, and uh, you know whether or not the people you're reaching are willing to open their wallet, right? So the main challenge with Facebook is that people aren't going to Facebook looking to spend money or solve some problem that they have, right? They're just there to like you know catch up on what their friends are doing. And uh, they're not in a mode where they're ready to spend money. So the most you can really hope for is raising awareness of your brand uh, with a Facebook ad. And again, it's hard to measure the value of that. So if I spend a thousand bucks on Facebook ads, I'm not going to get a thousand bucks in new course sales from that. So um, it doesn't really look worthwhile to me. Now, if I did have like a really high ticket offering, like, you know, thousands of dollars for personal consulting with me, uh, maybe I can make that work financially from paid ads. But um, like I said, I, I don't have time for that. So <laughs> that's not happening. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, and one of the things I've seen with advertising that works is that people will um, have like some kind of free gift and then they'll, they'll funnel people back to a landing page, which gets them on their email list. And the free gift is very educational in nature. So they're not trying to sell something right off the bat. They're, um, using what I call the MEI principle, which is from my book, the anti-marketing manifesto and it's motivate, educate, inspire. And so that's one, one approach that I've seen work as far as like using ads to get people onto an email list. Um, but you said you're not, you're not really doing that in you're well, I've tried it. Um, you know, again, it depends on your target audience, right? So I think that approach can work if you're reaching the right people and getting quality traffic into your funnel. Um, the problem that I have is that a lot of my audience is in places like India where they just don't have a lot of money to spend, right? So, you know, they're willing to take that free course that I offer at the top of the funnel, but getting them to convert into actually buying higher ticket items later on is extremely challenging. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you also mentioned uh, marketing is basically about raising awareness and um, raising awareness of your brand. So how would you describe your brand? Oh, I should have a, a very <laughs> snappy answer to that on hand, shouldn't I? Um, I mean, I would say that the brand is just, you know, trying to make difficult topics accessible. So um, the kind of the thing that I offer is explaining these highly technical, complex subjects in plain English and kind of demystifying them and avoiding all the fancy jargon and mathematical notation that often comes along with them to make them more inaccessible. Uh, you know, the fact is these are actually at their heart, pretty simple concepts to learn. And the world of academia is kind of surrounded with, with all this complexity to, uh, you know, be a bit of a gatekeeper as to who can learn them. So I, I try to smash through that. So if yeah. there's a brand identity I have, I'd say it's making this stuff more accessible. I love that. So you're simplifying it, making it more accessible, making it more understandable, taking what's complex and just chunking it down. That's, that's so great. And so in a few seconds, uh, we'll talk about your free gift that you have to offer. Um, 
but um, is there any other um, any other concepts about marketing that you want to leave our listeners with? You know, just the importance of uh, solving the right problems for people. I think that's really all it comes down to is, you know, are you finding people with a problem and do you offer a solution to that problem? And if you don't, then you got to think about that, right? In the case of online courses, it comes down to topic selection more than anything. You know, is there something people out there are itching to learn that they cannot learn elsewhere or they can only learn at extremely high expense? If so, you have a real opportunity, right? And marketing a course that solves that need uh, can be very, very effective. On the other hand, if I am trying to market a course that's about, you know, uh, learning to play guitar, where there's already 2,000 other courses on that out there that are ahead of me, no amount of marketing in the world is going to help that, right? So uh, it really comes down to finding unfilled needs. And sometimes you got to be creative about that. You know, you have to find uh, specific niches of what you're doing that aren't well met. Maybe you need to combine two topics together, like a lot of uh, a good recipe for success is finding two popular topics and finding the intersection of them, you know, and creating something around that. So uh, it really comes down to having the right product and without the right product, you can't have good marketing. Yeah. I love that. And remember guys, you should listen to Frank because he's sold over 600,000 courses. So he, he kind of knows what he's doing. Um, so you do have a free gift and it's probably only going to maybe apply to people that want to learn more about like artificial intelligence, right? or the technology set. Um, so do you wanna explain what your free gift is and let people know where they can find that and also post a link of that because I know it's a, a long URL um, somewhere on this page or video. Yep, yep. Yeah, if you head to my website at uh, sundog-education.com, you know, you can just go right there and uh, sign up for our free course on deep learning. So if you are curious about how artificial intelligence works, uh, like I said, it's pretty accessible. You know, you might not understand the math if you don't have any math background, but hey, it's free. You might pick up something, so check it out. And, um, you know, also free, if you are getting into the world of course creation uh, on Udemy, they have an instructor community where I'm very active and I'm always happy to offer advice there to my fellow new instructors and uh, kind of help people out there too for, for no cost either. So Amazing. Awesome. And yeah, and, and on that free, that free offer that he has, I did notice a paragraph that said, if you're afraid of artificial intelligence, this is a good way to like calm that fear because you can learn about it which i thought was really cool i was like oh okay i might even set up for that just to just see what that's about but yeah you guys check that out um awesome frank thank you so much for being on this interview i really appreciate the time um i feel like you're even with the data and the technology you, you do have a depth of wisdom to you which i think um came across on this interview really great so thank you so much for um showing up today and sharing your wisdom my pleasure thanks for having me all right all right, take care guys, um, I'm gonna end it there.